won the base photographer who recently graduated from Middlesex University. Recently from Royal College of Art. Royal College of Art, sorry. <laughs> that's Middlesex where you did your degree, isn't it? Yeah, BA, but that's four years ago, so yes. a little while. Sorry. No. Um, the driving shape, uh, shaping force of her work is often the everyday life and relationships with people she meets. Teresa draws her inspiration from painting and literature and describes her work as sensitive and intimate. Um, recently, uh, Teresa just uh, was commissioned by the National Portrait Gallery to, um, for, to celebrate their membership. Um, and obviously, some of us met Teresa in the Brighton uh, Photo Biennale uh, for the exhibition due uh, focus on a new, a new Europe. Okay? Uh, while that is happening, um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me and inviting me. Uh, so, how I do this talk um, is that because I think that rather than just telling you about um, sing, sing, like separate projects or A, I don't really work in projects as such, but we're telling you about things separately, it makes a lot more sense for you to understand how I got to where I am and how, uh, so that you can relate to the experience I've had because I was in your shoes and I was daunting the future and I was, and also I really believe that everything is interconnected. So um, the, the presentation is like a framework throughout which I will be telling you this, my, my story, basically. But whenever you feel like you have a question, please don't feel, don't feel ashamed. And please do ask questions, because um, it's an opportunity. And, and even, if, even there is nothing like a stupid question, and there is nothing like an unnecessary question, because everything is about, it's about perspective and about curiosity. And uh, so, yeah, I encourage you to interrupt me whenever. Hopefully, it also will make sense. But, but as, as you see, um, I'm, I will sometimes even I will sometimes jump jump back and forth, because yeah, I, I th through through June, which is the body of work, which actually brought me here, I realized that in my work there are not really there is not just one timeline. There is not just the linear day by day. Uh, calendar. There is also a, a time playing, which is kind of loop, which works more like a loop. And and because also what we are seeing in the, in the contemporary world is that history does repeat itself. And and I think that I I really truly believe in that. And I, I it's somehow echoing and resonating in in my in my practice. And I even start like that. So this image, I, 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 every time I speak about my work, I start with this image. But I took it um, 10 years ago when I had no idea that I'll be, ever become a photographer. At the time, I was still at high school. Um, I was 17. I was, I, I just, I bought the camera on the flea market. I didn't really know how to use it. It was a, it was a, double reflex camera, but I just found it as a beautiful object and, and let, let's try it. But the image that came out of it, um, I have so much affinity and so much, so, so many memories are connected to that image as well as something that is, that keeps um, being, uh, that keeps pulling me to, to take images at the moment. And also the way how I describe my practices that I, rather than, like I said earlier, I don't really work in projects. I see it all as one interconnected flow. Because, and, and I believe that an image I can take today, I could put it next to this image and you would find connections and you would find that it is taken by me. And a lot of people, when you, when you work with, when, when you, when, especially at university, there is, there is so much pressure on, uh, on how you present yourself, what you make work about. Um, and also this notion of, oh, but that project has already been done before. Perhaps, yes, but the problem is that it has not been done by you. Because everyone has a different sensitivity, different story to tell. And even, even if it, and, 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 there isn't, and there is no one like you. And even if you are going to make a story that has been done a million times before, if you are true to yourself and not, don't try to just copy someone else's vision of that, idea that's been done before, it will be unique because you will be reflected through that. Um, so 
to give you a little bit of my background and how I ended up with photography, uh, it was a complete accident. I, at high school, I was very academic. I thought I will, I was like one of the, one of the best in, in my class. And I thought everyone was commenting on like, oh, you, you'll be a diplomat or like you'll be a lawyer or you'll be, I don't know what. And I, I kind of took that, okay, fine. Um, that's not a bad trajectory. Um, but then also, uh, when I was young, I was scouted on the, on the street and asked if I would like to be a model. That really didn't come across come across my mind beforehand because I was just seeing myself as a super tall, um, skinny uh, girl who never will gonna have a boyfriend because I'm taller by head than all all the boys in my class. So <laughs> to, for me to think like, oh, actually, um, I look. A certain way was was strange but then when that uh, thing came across I was like okay why not I my parents weren't very rich so I thought actually I can make some pocket money I went along with it um, but when I started I have I made a promise to my parents that um, I will never get myself into trouble not myself don't get myself into trouble I meant I'll never uh, have an I'm never going to fall into the trap of eating disorder. Of course, uh, you can never promise such a thing. And what happened was that that's exactly what happened. And, if, and I, for a long time, I lived in denial of it. Um, I developed, um, I, I, I was denying up until like probably last month that I ever had anorexia. But actually, I realized that I did have anorexia as well. But what I recognized more was that I developed bulimia. And I kept that I kept that quiet because again it was like I promised that I'll never have problems, so I just I just kept it kept it in secret. And it wasn't until I f discovered photography that I found strength to to address that very traumatic moment of my life. Um, and it only came through the project of identity, which we which we uh, received in the second year of, of my degree. Also to, to say that I started on a fine art course, wasn't, I didn't start in photography, and the fact why I started on a fine art course was also because that was the only, only degree I had, I, I kind of applied to really subconsciously without any, any logical reason, because like I told you, I thought that I'm gonna study law or, or mm -hmm. international <laughs> politics, but I don't know why, but I applied to one university on fine art course, and that was my only saving grace. Because at the brink of of uh, my mental problems, I knew that I need a structure. I need to stop this, and I need to find something that will that will get me out of my head to um, to, to find my voice again. Because I was completely lost. But for the fine art course did not really do that to me. Because when I arrived the first day, they said. This is the best course in the world. You have all the freedom. You have no lectures, no tutorials. That's your space. Go and make art. I thought, uh, check. Because uh, <laughs> that's not, like, I really needed structure. So I started applying to history degrees. I thought, OK, this, is, this, this was something, but I'm not going to do that. And, but in the meantime, I needed, I, needed, um, I needed structure. And I've heard that Middlesex photography degree is very rigorous, very structured. They have lots of briefs. So I thought, great, that sounds like a great distraction for me. I'm going to go and, and do that in the meantime. And who would have thought that I will never, that once I transferred, that was history. So, um, so I just, I, it, for me, it was finding my voice. It was finding a way how I could express what was for years being, um, being, it was just like fermenting and and rotting, and suddenly there was this way how I could how I could reach out. And with this university brief identity, even though it sounds so broad and it sounds so cliche almost, I thought this is a perfect opportunity for me to address this and perhaps finally resolve it in in some way. And I thought, how am I going to do that? Um, and that's when portraiture, which stayed with me until now, came to the forefront of the forefront of, of my of my thinking. 
I was very reluctant to do projects of self-portraiture because at that time I was um, I, I had about 15 kilos more than when I was the skinniest. Uh, I really hated my photo have, having my having having my photo taken, and it was actually giving me a panic. And so I thought, how can I how can I create um, something about me, but through through working with other people, and because I know that uh, the beauty ideal and and body self aware. So being self-aware of your body isn't just a matter of models. It's so very much part of um, anybody's reality who lives in, in contemporary um, society. And, and so I made a mind map and I, I wrote what everything this problem has, has um, impacted. And it wasn't just health issues. It wasn't just body image. It was social life. I felt super isolated. Then it was sensitivity. I really felt that even though I have, I have inherited this body, um, body bank or like how to say that, um, this frame. But inside, I'm so not suitable to this to this world. So um, I wrote this mind map about everything that has been that I felt was affected, and um, and I approached young women who. I knew also that had struggled with, with, with this notion, with this, with this pressure of, of how we should be, how we should be perceived, and what is the only way for us to be respectable, or how we basically how we should be, which causes so much, so much struggle. And what happened was that I created this self, um, that this this um, expansive self-portrait through which. I finally was able to talk about what happened to me. Um, and what happened was that this was end of my, this was middle of my second year, but um, I, so I, I went, the re reason why I'm telling this is because to, to reach into such a personal story can be very frightening, and, uh, and it was. It was actually I never told my parents until I was doing this that I had a I had a problem. Um, so suddenly you are going into into a, a completely different realm from what a university project can how where a university project can take you. It can help you address things that it can give you courage basically. But um, and and then what was what was meant to be just a university project then ended up on public display when I won five under 30 uh, competition in Daniel Blau Gallery, which, is in Hox which was in Hoxton. And suddenly this, this, uh, this, self, this little confession got into the public realm and I had to, and I had to deal with that. So this was at, when I was at university, when I was doing photography about a year and a half, and obviously I got a lot of, um, I got a lot of, success and, and the recognition and I thought okay great so I'm just gonna continue with with this work I was entering my third year and I I thought okay that's a, that's an easy way to to finish my third year and to and to um, basically that, that that was like oh this is this is betting on on success but it's like there I for the first time experienced that you can't force something that making it I ended up with a collection of 10 portraits and those 10 portraits were really genuinely like the girls when I photographed them there was an exchange it was for the <laughs> first time when I coined this um, phrase that I always use that for me a portrait is an exchange and when I take someone's portrait the way how I uh, what the way I, how I approach those portraits was that I told them my story more in detail than I told you, um, but I, I, I was like, this, this is, this is what happened to me. You can share as much as you want, as you feel comfortable with me. Some of the girls told me everything. Some of them didn't even say a word, and we just exchanged a moment of, uh, of, of emotions. And there was a lot of crying in those portrait sessions, um, but I. When I felt that that was not happening anymore in the portrait, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm not going to force it, then I moved on to something else. Um, 
and I moved completely. So I went into, up until then, I was just using black and white, and I thought, okay, I'm going to explore color. And, um, and that's when my passion for darkroom printing happened. I, I, went into the, I went into the project with, um, with no framework, just like taking images as I take, and in a very diaristic form. But materiality became something that has stayed with me as well. Making these talks make me realize how everything is interconnected and how already um, this is what, this is six or seven years ago, I was working in the same way that I work now, but just everything that happened in between helped me contextualize it and, gave, and, and, and not disregard what I was doing then, even just enhance it and take it and use it as a, as a it, it's almost like if you think about your heritage, you would not put away your heritage, you just take it and that's, 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 what, that's, what, that's, that's the foundations. And, and that's how I see, that's, 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 the, that, that's the foundations when everything was happening. And what I was talking about looping, I'll, I'll, come back to the, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to refer to, for example, this image. Because what it is, is just to take, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a double spread from one of my sketchbooks where um, I was, it was, it was the third year and I was thinking of how am I going to uh, lead, how, how, I wanted to do something else, I wanted to do something loose. And so, but I, I had these contact sheets, I had these material, uh, the images were not just what they represented, they were there in my hands and I started to play with that material and where, it, where, you, can, where you could push that. And, um, and, and blending it, working with collage, also made me realize that color has a very... Um, the symbolism of color, and you'll see that later on as well, that uh, sometimes being just, cha just, just being, being so responsive to, to how f images flow into one another can bring you to have certain ideas, and, and sometimes the work actually will lead you. This was one of the first times when I actually work in, in, uh, in, in, in groupings, and this, is, this, was, this was the quadriptych that then brought me really into how I developed my, the work in my third year. Um, I called this like present memories, because already then I was playing with how does, how does time operate, and how does we have a memory, but we can revisit it? But of course, it was not going to be the same. But it will still have that place in ourselves, which we can relate to. It's almost like with smell; that senses also are so interconnected. If you go and if you smell a certain certain thing, it will take you. It will take you somewhere. If you if you smell a certain soap, you will remember. It might take you back to your grandmother's house because she was using it. And it's almost like I, I revisited these places. This is a swimming pool where I where I where I used to swim, and I wanted to go and see see that. And what happened was that I didn't intend it for the photograph to be like that, but because of the steam in the swimming pool, my lens steamed up, and it was only in the aftermath when I saw that oh, this is this image is like the head is completely blurry, and what how more poignant a memory could be represented that sometimes. These, these signals were already, they were just listening. The work will, work will talk to you in a way. That's what I'm trying. When, when you let yourself be free in, in, in the making there, and receptive to what you actually create, then, then there will be a, a huge feedback. Just, just, just trust, trust it. And I mean, I have loads of time, so I can go into details as well. Um, and so the people who are in these photographs, they are my siblings, and um, and that's my brother, and he's also the one of the blur image, and that's my sister. And for many time, for for quite a long period of time, I struggled with the idea of um, can I can I be photographing my family? Is it not too easy? Is it not um, is it not just being lame or or not? pushing further, but actually then I realized that it's not, that they don't have to just be themselves. For me, of course, they're, they're there, but people can be vessels for something, just like objects can be vessels for something. And, and, when, and, and that's when I, my, where my artistic love affair with my brother started, because he became, he's my biggest muse, but, and I see him 
in my, and I see myself in him. So when I started photographing him, he was 11. Now he's 21 almost. And uh, no, 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 that doesn't work out. Uh, well, anyways, a, a long period of time. Um, and, and there is another time passing and him reoccurring in all these projects doesn't mean that there is not that, that there's something wrong with that. It's just a way how I, how I, how I operate and how time can be, um, how time can be counted as well and, and, and registered. And so then we came to, um, and this is, this is that now I'm entering my final body, third year, final major project, which many of you are, are probably working on at the moment. And I called it verse. Um, and the initial, in, in the, in, the initial um, motivation or like desire to, to make what I wanted to make to start with was that I wanted to, through my own experiences, make something poetic and make something. I was, I, my, I like, like uh, Matt said that one of the biggest inspirations for me isn't photography, but it's literature and in particular poetry. At the time I was looking at a lot of haiku, which is Japanese um, poetry, very concise, very short, and um, it has quite uh, strict rules of how it's written. But what I like about it is there are themes, uh, which are often nature, atmosphere, and feelings, uh, which is reflected in my work. But then also that that you see that often two lines are somehow connected, and then the third line completely tricks you. It it suddenly like leaves this huge space for you to be surprised or confused. But at the same time, why why look at why look at it that way? Why can't we look at that gap that is created as something? Um, that can be filled by by you again. Can be filled by your interpretation. Can be filled by your perception of the work. Can be filled by our experience. Even that. Even the. It could be the disregard, but because you can't appease everybody. But, anyways, I'm going <laughs> off a little bit. But um, so yeah, I decided to create a poetry book and uh, and sim and call it simply verse because that's what poetry is made of. Um, it was almost like every image became became a letter or a word, and then there are numerous possibilities of how one could um, how one could put them together. And there are perhaps perhaps there are nuances and echoes in in the imagery that only I see. Sometimes there are more more uh, direct ones. Sometimes there were there were a very very loose ones. But I just I just played with it and without having any certain uh, description of the work, it was, it was really based on, um, on, on my own experience and, and what was happening at the moment. And, but at the same time, trying to, trying to push what I was, as I was saying, that um, you, you, can have, you can have two things that are very quite well suited to each other, but then push, put something Put something else. A lot of the time, I really didn't have any rational, ra rational um, explanations of how I put how I put things together and and why. But I also don't think that you would have to, because if you look at photography as art, which I very much believe in, and that's my approach to it. If you were a painter, nobody would ask you, so why did you put red color there and green color there? So why do you have to ask a photographer why did you put this? To that, if if it's if it's instinctive, so I would if if you feel like that's a way how you want to work, I would very much encourage that because yeah, if even when you think about music, how you go and dance, everything is just a self of way of self of expressing oneself, and nobody would ask you why you why you move a certain way. So so why should you restrict yourself in in creating visual language? As well, so when I finish, so so I somehow managed to finish my BA and create this book of book of poetry, which I still go through. And I made a handmade book, and then I was it was leading up to 
to the degree show, which was at Truman Brewery in East London, where you'll be showing as well. And, and there is a lot of pressure on the third years, and you kind of feel like suddenly people talk about, so how much should I sell my prints for? And, and you get this crazy like boost of like, okay, on that day, my life is going to be resolved and I'm going to become the photographer. But the reality is a bit different. What happens is this. Nothing. Um, you just, <laughs> you have your degree show, you wake up the next morning and, 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 you, and you end up thinking like, so what now? And, um, and you just have to keep on going. You just have to, um, if, if it's really what you want to do, then just get ready on the fact that it will be hard and that it will be daunting and that there will be a lot of hours of uh, of thinking what the hell did myself did my uh, did I get myself into <laughs> um, what how can I get out like how can I make sense of of this but I remember when I when I transferred to photography one of the first lectures we had uh, one of the two, one of my tutors say so there is 80 of you in the class if Two of you will become photographers. That's a good. That's a good outcome, and it is true, um, or like more or less to be completely honest. But when I heard that, <laughs> I already realized that okay, I want to be one of the two, and in order to do that, it's kind of you. You just have to give it your all. It's uh, my father, my both parents have artistic background and they, when I was thinking, oh, I want to be an artist, that I want to be a painter or a illustrator or whatever, my dad is a perfect, he's an incredible drawer, 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 draft, draft, draftsman. Um, and so he made me this crazy still lives with drapery, glass, cut through bread with holes and like he said oh and now I'm going painted I was crying like crazy and um, and he was like no but you have to want to make this you have to you your aim at the end of the day is to have this draw to have this drawing perfect and and then you can go to sleep you have to wake up with thinking about drawing and you have to go to sleep thinking about drawing and of course I wasn't thinking about it and if I was thinking about that it was just how I hated it and how it was really not what I wanted to do because I didn't, it wasn't, I didn't, it wasn't, um, it didn't click with me, it was, it was a pain. And I'm not saying that it should never be a pain, it should, there should be a, there should be an element of, of hardship and of pushing in what you find is yours, but it shouldn't be like that. And then when I transferred to photography, I suddenly realized that, oh, I'm going to bed with photography and I'm waking up with photography. Um, and and that was so magical and I can't tell you how rewarding it is even now when I can tell that I actually became one of those two people where photography I'm living from my from only from photography <coughs> and and even that is a success in itself and I wish you all to to be, be before even it might not be photography but just what I encourage you to do is just to experiment and find what is what it is that that makes you click that makes you kind of almost forget everything else and just makes you keeps you keeps you driven because for me it was photography and even though it was hard and i was sending at least 40 emails a day to different photographers in terms of assisting to picture editors to show them my portfolio to galleries to work as an invigilator anything creative um, at the same time i was i kept shooting I was because I was intrigued by what was going on around me, and um, and somehow I ended up with this picture. This picture I photographed at my best friend's wedding when um, my friend went somewhere went somewhere, and this was one of her very good friends, Ingvild, and we ended up in in this uh, house together, and we started talking. We exchanged. Um, we, we, we had a quite a long conversation and at the end of it I was like, could I, would you mind if I take your portrait? And she said, no, no, of course, go ahead. Um, and uh, so I took one roll of film and, and this was the last one in the roll. I was going to load another one, but then I thought, 
actually, I don't think I need to because when I took that picture, I remembered that um, everything interconnected. Sometimes uh, people say that they feel when they take the image, and um, doesn't doesn't happen often, but it happened to me quite a, quite a few times. That, but it's again about just trusting that some something happened there. And when this picture, when I took this picture, I just in my head, everything inter interconnected. The background with the with the foreground, she became part of the outside and the inside, and 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 I just knew that there was something special in that picture. So I packed the camera and we we had tea or we went we went our way. Um, and then there there came the time of the year when everyone was applying for Taylor Wessing. Perhaps many of you also heard about the Taylor Wessing Prize, which is the portrait uh, prize taken place in National Portrait Gallery every year. And um, Middlesex University, it's very quite, they have quite a good big history with their students being being selected for it. Uh, I was once selected prior to this picture as well. And uh, so when I was making my selection, I chose four images which I sent. And with this image, I was really doubtful whether I should send it. Not because I didn't like it, but because I thought they would never go for it. It's too faintly, it's, it's, it's just, it's not a typical Taylor Wessing picture. And what happened then, a few, few months later, when I got a call, and, uh, and it was, hello, this is, uh, am I speaking to Teresa? I said, yes, um, who is this? And she said, this is Clementine from the National Portrait Gallery. I would like to congratulate you and say that you've won John Cobo Award. So not only I was selected, I actually won a prize that was given to the photographer under 30 who was selected for, for, for the prize. So there again, it's just about saying that um, don't, if you ever come, if you are ever submitting your work to competitions, which I really encourage you to do, don't think about the outcome of, no, don't think about what the judges will want. Of course, don't send abstract photography to world press photo. But I mean, actually, having said that, why not? If if it's relevant, just just uh, be aware of the relevance of the imagery. But never try to pre pre predict of what will be liked and what won't, what will not be liked. Because in my experience, actually, when you try to push and when you when you challenge something, and when again you just trust yourself, things can work out in a real good way. So when I won this image, not only I um, um, got exposure, got a monetary prize, which is of course very helpful <laughs> in photography, but also, um, and the best thing was that I got a commission. I got a commission to photograph someone from the UK film industry that is connected uh, for, for, their, for their permanent collection. And um, I photographed Jack O'Connell, who's a young actor, some of you might know him, he worked. He was in Skins, uh, but he and, and in many other in many other things lately on, on uh, in the West End theater show with. Uh, and, and, but what was really amazing was again that you don't have to they, they just stay true to yourself. If you see if you see the link between those two Im images, I think there is I think there is quite a strong one that. But it was again not me pre pre preconceiving that how I want to take a photo of him. That's another interesting perhaps thing for you to hear is that um, that you, for for me the way I work is that I never have a preconceived idea of how I'm going to take for what the portrait is going to look like. All my own one and only requirement is that there needs to be natural light because that's the only think I, I need for my work to be created, but I actually like the going into the unknown of a room, going into the how can, how can I make things work and, 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 and what is, even that is part of, part of the image. So this picture, I was supposed to take it within the year of, the, of, the, of receiving the prize, but it was much longer, I think it was like two and a half years because hey, he was away or we couldn't make it work, but it was nice, really nice co cooperating with the John Cobo Foundation and the National Portrait Gallery. Again, just being very respectful can, and patient and, and listening to one another. When, when the outcome is just have, it's about realizing that 
both sides want to come up with with an outcome they're happy with and time is time is almost not irrelevant but time is kind of kind of secondary but so so we'll, let's just wait for the moment when to make sense so this i went i went to darby and i photographed jack in his mother's house i had three hours with him we were in his mom's garden he was smoking fags i was drinking tea we we took we, we took photos funny thing like fun fact um he thought i am a, a painter <laughs> he thought because he said oh he's he's gonna have his portrait taken for the national portrait gallery collection and his idea was like oh uh it's, it's it's gonna be the painting because most of the collection is painting so he was expecting me to come with the with the with the tripod and my oil paint but then i was like no i'm actually a photographer so that was a that was a nice little anecdote that you never know what you're gonna get and he was so generous and he plays all these like rough bad boy um roles but he's super super lovely and um yeah so so anyways so and and I now I'm going to show you another picture which is very recent, but again connected with the National Portrait Gallery, and to see how images, even though there is again time scale. So the first image of Inkveld was 2014. That one was uh, Jack is taken like early 2017, and this is 2018. Things. And all of them are brought together, like there is a, there is a common denominator as the National Portrait Gallery, and then me. And then you see that the, perhaps there is, there is a push in, in, um, in perception or like in visual, even development of the visual language, but it's still, I think, very strongly visual language of, of one person. And, and I, I think that once you can recognize that this is yours, you should try to own it. But anyways, um, so this is an image of Douglas, who I photographed, as Matt mentioned, for the National Portrait Gallery Commission this summer, where they commissioned me to take uh, six portraits of the members for their collection and as a celebration of their membership scheme, which is uh, running for 20 years now. And it was incredible uh, experience. and. Uh, I was in the middle of my MA when I received this email, which was very brief and very um, non non glamour. It just was like I almost swiped it to my to my trash folder, and then I think and I, then I re thought, hang on, it just says National Portrait NPG Commission in subject line. Maybe maybe don't trash that one. <laughs> so I reread the email again, and there it was saying that. They are asking me to come for a meeting about a comm commission, and again I had to shake myself. Okay, I have, I have been, um, I'm, rec I, I have a certain connection with them, but still, for someone of my age, from a different country, all these things to me played, played a role that I never take. It's not to be taken for nothing is taken for granted, and uh, and and again, an incredible. Um, experience with with the National Portrait Gallery, um, where where I where they completely listened to me and let let me let let me have it almost my way in a little bit because I came up with an idea that um, I want to, how I can work within the framework of the gallery within the framework of what is available to me and how can I reflect the people in 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 those spaces. Um, and then, so, any questions so far? Shall I just keep on going and then at the end? So, and as I said perhaps before, it's a, um, or maybe I haven't said that yet. So, but a very important thing for me in my career was at when I first started getting commissions, when I finished uh, graduating, when I graduated, um, was that okay? This is this is how it's done, right? Like you make your work on film if you like film, and then if you get commissions, then you do that on digital because that's that's the common that's that's the usual way. Also, editorial is really badly paid. So if you are if I was to use it use film for that. I'd be completely broken. I would be leaving with a job with 50 quid in my pocket out of the job, which doesn't really make 
economic sense, right? So I did two jobs. Uh, one job I did on digital completely, but what I came up with, and I felt so not comfortable with that. So then I went on to do, when I got my other commission, which was about two or three months later, um, I took both. I took digital and I took my film camera. I took digital in the first place, but then at the end I took 10 pictures on, on, my, on my camera. And of course, all the ones I sent them were for just from, from my film camera. They chose them and, and I thought, actually, I'm so much happier with these. And then I made the choice of, I'm just going to work with film because this is how I feel more comfortable. Even that one, time, that one day when I took, when I took photos of, on both, I felt so uncomfortable with the digital camera. And when I, took, when I used my film camera, I just felt like <coughs> fish in the water. It's like, yeah. This is, this is what I'm talking about. And, uh, and, um, and I thought, whatever, so I'm going to earn a little bit less money to start with, but I, will, I feel good about what I'm producing. And that's not to say that digital is bad by no means. Like, digital has so many wonderful aspects that you can use it, but it just doesn't work for me. It makes me, it, it breaks my flow, it breaks my focus, it breaks my connection with the person. But, but that's just me. So, again, just to say that once you recognize what works for you, go for it fully. And, um, and so to come back to what you're looking at, um, these are, this is a commission from summer of 2017, which was one of the nicest commission, com one of the really nice commissions I've had, which were, I was commissioned by the Telegraph uh, magazine to photograph women in art. And... So this is another thing that once you sh once you stick to your um, stick to who you are and who you're interested in, then you start getting these commissions which are reflecting your interests as well. Co these these picture editors that I was meeting, um, they I was always bringing them to show them my personal work. So if you think about uh, to, if I go back, the first time I met um, Telegraph picture editor, I showed him these pictures. Um, in a way, not what Telegraph magazine publishes at all, um, but it's it's about if you if you if you come if you go there confident and if you find your visual language, then it's also about trusting the the people who will commission you that they can see that you can take pictures and this is what you're going to come with. So even though I'm not looking at a portrait, I can see that in, that things in that that in, the, in that frame are working so that you can actually come up with a portrait if I give you the commission. Um, and, and yeah, I was talking about art and I was talking about my background and suddenly I was getting these amazing commissions when I ended up photographing the director of Tate within a month of her being appointed as the first woman director of the Tate Galleries. And all these things to me have uh, have value and I appreciate them again don't take it for granted and, and take it and use it for my own growth as an artist and as a photographer photograph and every, every single one was very different Maria Bolsho I had um, I had 15 minutes to take her portrait I took her to two locations you have to once you get to these these kind of commissions uh, when time becomes so valuable I recently photographed the uh, I um, photographed a politician very close to Ther Theresa May's position. Uh, I had five minutes, and you just have to make those five minutes work. Every second counts, and and the focus has to go to four hundred percent because you know that this is this is all you've got. And then um, Julie Verhoeven, she's an artist. That was completely different. I came. Uh, I had an assistant, I don't really work with assistants, but because this one was the first time that I had like a big commission, um, and time was very precious, so I thought it's actually quite nice to have someone there to just be there, even if I need any sort of help. And I, so I was there, gonna, I started to direct my assistant to like go there. There was a tiny, tiny, tiny little uh, window in the back of her studio as the only light source. I was like, oh, okay, this is gonna be, <laughs> Problematic, um, but I was so I sent my I sent my assistant to go into there to see how the light works. But Julie was like, "Oh no, oh, I'm gonna go." 
Um, so we did the pictures within the first 15 minutes of us entering her studio, and then we were having tea, we were talking about the Royal College of Art, Brexit, obviously, um, and, um, at, and then that image actually ended up in the portrait, International Portrait Gallery as well, because, so again, you don't know what that commission will lead to and where that photograph will end. You should never look at it as that's the only, that, that's, the, that's the final, so you get commission from the Telegraph magazine, so that's where the image is going to stop and, and its life ends once that magazine is out of print and next week is in a, another magazine. If you look at your work as something that lives and breathes and develops with you, that image will stay and will inform a lot of other things. And then again, talking about um, income, when I photographed Victoria Sida, who is a director of Fries Art Fair, um, I, I took the photo, then they saw it in the, in the magazine, and a couple of months later they, uh, they emailed me that they would like to buy the rights for that picture. So in a way, again, I used, I used uh, a lot of my um, fees portion to film and then also to uh, have an assistant then. So I didn't end up with earning much money at all. Actually, I flew from my holiday for this one because I wanted to do it, and I, but I wasn't in London at the time. So again, that was even, I earned even less for that one, but I just really felt like it's a great opportunity. But then again, they, they asked me to, to buy, buy the rights for the image. So just from that, I earned more than for the whole commission. So things are like, this is one thing that is not being taught to the universities very much. I don't know about this one, but how business, how, how money side of actually being an artist operates. It's still, I'm still learning every day I go and, and it's very uncomfortable if you don't have an agent or someone that guides you, which I don't. Um, but again, being, being open about things and being, um, being genuine that like people from the from the John Coble Foundation who commissioned me to do the Jack O'Connell portrait they the uh, chairman who's now stepped down but he was chairman for many years Simon Crocker I emailed him and he was very happy to to chat through contracts with me so again these things are if, if you are you have to be bold and you have to be put yourself out there but they there if, if you come with a clean and genuine intentions, they're very happy to help you. So he, he explained to me the contract, he explained to me how that operates, what can I ask for, and what, I sh what is too much, what is too little. And then being in, in, in um, as a reciprocity, I gave him a print. So things are, yeah, it's, 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 all, it's all very fluid, and you, you learn from, from uh, your experiences. Another really lovely uh, commission was from the FT uh, Weekend magazine, which um, here they commissioned me to photograph refugee women uh, who work in a, who who are part of the ch with whom a charity Women for Refugee Women work, and they also collaborated with another artist, uh, painter Caroline Walker, who uh, whose paintings are in the background, and um, so again two interests of mine who who kind of came into a really wonderful commission, women's uh, perception of femininity, women's rights, and art got together in a commission which the picture to needs to know your personal work in order to think, okay, this would be a right person to, to shoot this. So again, I encourage you to all, don't divide your portfolios, your personal portfolios, and like the portfolio you will be taken to the possible commissioner because you never, you never know what will caught the, catch their eye and make you um, make you stand out and make them persuade, make them persuade you that you are the right person for the job. And um, this is quite a recent image, and but again I'll be repeating myself how important it is to don't not be scared of your personal work. So this is an image of Maxine Peake and Desiree Akava from the set of uh, The Bisexual, uh, which is a TV series that has um, been on Channel 4 recently. Um, again, I was 
in the middle of the craziness of my MA, I got a phone call in February from, but I didn't, and, and when I, it was, they left a voicemail and I really didn't understand the voicemail. It was like, hello, do you want to do, have you ever done uh, unit photography? We would be interested in meeting you. I was like, here is the, here is the phone number. I hate when people do that. Then they, they tell you the phone number and then you have to repeat a million times to catch it. Anyways, thankfully they sent an email as well. Um, but again, I had no idea what unit photography was. But um, any commission, you at least go and ask what it's about because there are not that many around. Um, so, so I met Liz, which is the picture editor for uh, Channel 4 TV, and um, and and loveliest woman in the world. Again, she said, do you actually know what unit photography is? I said, not quite. Uh, so, so she explained that it's a, it's a stills, it's stills photography that you take um, on set of movies or TV series. And um, it's not behind the scenes as such. It is to replicate, to create an image that will be, uh, that will represent the episode or that will represent a scene in the movie. And uh, they asked me if I would be interested in doing something like that. And I was like, yes, sure. Um, however, uh, how would this work? So she said, she, she gave me like a little framework of things. And then, uh, but she said, but I think important is for you to meet the product, pr production company and speak to them. So I said, okay, let, let's meet them. And this was one of the most rewarding meetings at, up until this point, because when I arrived, uh, you, I'm sure you've seen mood boards or when in, either in the when, like companies bring mood boards, like uh, how we want certain things to be. Like. They had a mood board that was uh, basically entirely made up of my own personal photographs, and they were saying we want our unit photography to look like this, and there are images of my brother, of my ex-boyfriend, of of my hometown. It was very, very moving, and as well, they said, we don't want a photographer to do this job, we want an artist to do this job. They are little things, and, and they might sound cliche, but for someone it, like me, it was incredibly encouraging. And, I, and there, you kind of also have to take um, your own, to stand your ground. I said, great, that is very, I feel very honored, but if you want these images, you have to play, you have to, um, I, I don't want to say play my game, but you have to allow me to do my thing. And my thing is that I shoot everything on film. Um, and I literally, I had no idea how it's going to work, but I knew that if I were to take photos on a film set and it would have to come out of my fee, I would be going out <laughs> with, with nothing in my pocket. And they were like, okay, great. So they, they paid for all the film. And this was before I knew what it's going to be like. Um, if someone like if someone works with only natural light, then you enter this whole world of darkness <laughs> when you work on movies. Because uh, even if it's a beautiful bright day, they would darken things up so that they can they can control the light. But I just I just went with it and um, and and enhanced it. And what we came out of was a really interesting set of photographs that both them like and I. I'm really happy with as well. Another really interesting learning curve was that um, we did, I don't think we, they didn't anticipate uh, working, as they said, with an artist and not a unit photographer because there we came, I was already working for them for a couple of weeks. And then we came like, oh, but we haven't actually signed a contract with the, I signed a contract with the television, but not with the production company. And there we entered a problem, which was, which was copyright. Normally, uh, unit photography is entirely owned by, co by the production company. Um, but I was like, no, I would swear if I thought I can, but no way I am giving my copyright away for this. But then we entered a problem, like, okay, so how are we going to solve this issue? And I also thought, I don't, want, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable for me to give you these images for this price that you are used to because if you're going to own them forever and I'm losing then I want you, you know it, it just became again it, from something really beautiful it started to became a bit bit uh, 
sticky and uncomfortable. Um, but we we came to a solution. Again, I called the guy from the from the John Cobo Foundation, and I he he gave me help. He gave me advice, and and then I spoke back to the production company, and we came up with a solution where they they allowed. So so we now both own. I I own the copyright, and they have never done that before. So just to say that sometimes if you really strongly believe in something and you stand, you fight for your rights, you will get them even though you it might not be the case before but just again trusting trusting what you what you believe in um a jump but again this was one of the images that i showed them at that meeting which was then my what i was doing at the time at the royal college of art experimentation in the dark room um and i showed when we were talking about atmosphere and how um, you know, the bisexual, I didn't really know about the story, but you can imagine that it's about sensuality and about intimacy. And I showed them this image and I thought, this is somehow how I can imagine it working. What would you think? And they loved it. And they again gave me this green, green light about like, go and do whatever you want to do. And that was, that was re incredibly, um, uh, incredibly liberating and and yeah and these are just a few few images that that were play that were playing on that idea um then another image from the commissioned world and how even when it's something very different to your practice like for me images of handbags how that can also have a certain link with with what 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 you do as in your personal life and it just like taking it playfully and so of course, I had to understand that the handbag has to be in the forefront, but it doesn't have to just be um, what, what we see on ASOS um, what, when, or, or things like that, that it, it can have a twist to it. And, uh, and also another important part, um, I'm already speaking for an hour, is that it's like I have... Yeah, it's all right. Okay, if you, want, if you guys want to break, I can break, but I'm taking my time because I know I have time, so <laughs> actually it's, it's quite nice. Um, uh, is everyone okay so far? Cool. Um, yeah, so sometimes sometimes you don't know how you can bring in people who are your friends. So this is a company I was working with for a long time, Sophie Hume company. Another fun fact, for the first time I got in touch with Sophie Hume as a company was when I was commissioned to uh, do a portrait for the Telegraph again of her. Uh, she really liked the portraits. She bought rights for the portrait and then commissioned me again to take her press shots and then she liked those again so then they went like oh we want to collaborate to, with you for a year you get a commission a month you get a grant for the commission so that means you can pay for your rent and your life every month and and uh, and we will find ways to to make things work and we just want you to make create our visual language I was, it was even before I started BRCA, I was of course up in the clouds, it was amazing. But again, how, who could have known when I took this photo for the Telegraph where it's going to take me? But, the, but it, it did take me there because of I sticked to what, what I believed in. So this was one of the last commissions I did for them where uh, the, work, the Leanne, the lady I worked with for most of the time while, while working with them, she said, I'm really struggling to find a model, do you know of someone? And I was like, well, I have this friend, Delfina. She's quite interesting. Would you be interested in working with her? So like, yeah, sure. Send me a photo of her iPhone. They brought her in. So not so, so you can even influence things in such a way as bringing someone you are close with to photograph to, to work with for a commercial client. Um, then Delfina, who is an artist and researcher herself, uh, put me in touch with. Um, someone she worked works with at the Royal College of Art, uh, who is Helga Schmidt, who she is, she's as well a PhD, she's a doctor now, um, and she works with time. She works with um, the Ukra something she named uh, Ukrainian time, which deals with uh, how our bodies um, experience time without a clock. How, when would we go to sleep? When would we eat? When would we feel tired? When would we feel active? If it if we were if we were taken out of the the framework of 
like okay i wake up at seven at nine i start work at five i finish at seven i have dinner at uh, 11 i go to bed so um and as an experiment she put me and delfina into um into a home and we were not allowed to uh, walk out and delfina was supposed to live her life without knowing the clock and i was supposed to photograph the nuances of her of her daily rhythms so of course but there was my biorhythm involved as well so the, even though like delfina was allowed to do whatever she wanted i had to stay up all night and photograph things like um um i, I don't know the term helga this is her part but you know when we when you fall asleep the first there are different stages of sleep but it was a very interesting experience for me which then ended up part of this incredible installation uh, which uh, Helga showed in Istanbul for the Istanbul Biennial and uh, yeah because so, so there are seven phases and the and she so up there there are seven um, you see what are they half circle like part cir circles and depending on which phase uh, Delphina was going through they, they lit up again how photography can be can be something completely um, completely different and but it's still very much mine and again we talked about the, the legal part of it so who owns the copyright of this work is it Helga because she commissioned it and it's her idea but then what about my photographs they play a um, crucial part of the installation if two people Come with genuine of course i mean so far maybe i just had a very good experience but um i think that if you if you are clear and willing to collaborate on 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 something together and you you have your you have your grounds to stand on but at the same time appreciate and respect the other person's uh, intentions and desires then you can come up with a solution actually the solution for us now is that if the work is presented um as an installation and as a research project, Helga is always the one who, who's play, who is the creator and initiator and who, ha who has a huge uh, name on top. And I'm just downstairs, I'm just on the bottom as images by Teresa Cervinova. If the project is pro pr presented as a pho as, as photography project, then it's me. So there is this collaboration also on that level because also another thing I want to talk about is um, about doing something for free and when it's okay to do that and when it's not to okay to do that because this one um, I when I, it, I we did it this June basically two evenings before my opening of my degree show so you can imagine me my stress levels and and then I agreed to not sleep all night <laughs> to be up for 24 hours to do this it was a bit crazy things to do but at the same time I was intrigued and I saw it as an opportunity for something to enrich my practice but again she came up with a budget of 300 pounds which um, when you are supposed to take photos for 24 hours um, I thought okay well I'm not coming up I'm not coming out with anything so basically whole 300 pounds was used just for for um, for for materials and and that all and I didn't mind that, but at the same time, when she asked for seventy images to be um, scanned and retouched, it meant so many hours behind the computer that I started to feel like, oh, that's actually a little bit annoying. But um, but again, what is happening now on the back of those images is is. Uh, it's really nice and there so the payment came in something else the payment came in exposure in understanding of practice in a different way in reaching out to different fields because now this work is living a lot in the in the design sphere rather than art sphere or photography sphere it's actually going to be displayed in the design museum in february and uh, and yeah i didn't come out with anything f like a salary from that but because it's a collaboration that's that's really nice Sometimes I did jobs, especially as an assistant, when I was really badly paid, and and you need to, there you come to a solution. What am I doing this for? Am I learning anything, or am I just become doing this because it's uh, this is how I've heard it 
the photography world operates, that you do internship there without any pay, you assist this guy for, an, for an, no pay just to be able to put things on your CV. I don't really believe in that. I think that the, the payment doesn't have to be money, it has to be knowledge and, and exchange, actually, what you can give and what you can get. Um, yeah, that's just one other portrait from the series, but again, it could very easily be part of my own, own personal work. And then Delfina also is the leading person to will, who is going to lead me to June, to my work from, the, from, the, from, from MA, because she's my friend and she, so how, how, again, like how one person can, how one thing can spread into many things. So she's been part of my commercial work. She brought me into this other collaboration, and and she is she is part of June as well as someone who not only is part of it as and their photograph is part of it, but who also helped me shape the thinking behind it. She uh, I spoke she, because she studied at the Royal College of Art. I asked her before I started there, what do you think sh about the course? Should I go there? Should I not go there? And it was actually the first time that I was uh, that I had coffee with her that I thought, actually, there are two years of the MA and there are two years of the divorce of the Brexit divorce period. That's quite um, interesting. Maybe I should, maybe I can embrace embrace that. But this was prior to prior to June. At that time I had no idea what will come. I just knew that I'm starting this, uh, this MA course which is very conceptual, which is very, um, which is very, very um, challenging and I now was thinking how am I going to embrace that. And then, uh, as we all know, on 23rd of June was the referendum and then on the 24th of June I was at the Royal College of Art and um, they had a degree show then and I was there. It was a very conflicting um, moment for me because I, was, I woke up heartbroken and I knew that I'm going to, I'm gonna go to this institution, I'm gonna spend here my two years and, and what does it mean? Am I, this, this thinking process behind what was happening at the time was like, I'm sure a lot of you can relate, but that uncertainty that that vote brought to life of so many was very, has shook me fundamentally, and has uh, and and so, like I said before, that there was this opportunity for me to push my practice in in an institution like the Royal, Co Royal College of Art, um, which when I went there. The motivation, I'm not sure if many of you know about the college, but a lot of people go there and it has, it's an experiment, it's an experiment, experiment, it's a lot of people experiment when they go there and a lot of people really uh, abandon their visual language and, and completely change it. So you start on a photography degree, but you end up doing performance or you do, do start doing sculpture. And there's nothing wrong with it that's really interesting and exciting, but not for me. I knew that when I was going there, I really wanted to, I didn't want to change my practice, I wanted to challenge it. And I saw this um, time we're living in as, a, as an opportunity. I saw it as a possibility to become more political because I felt that as, as a person, up until that point, I was part of this generation who was enjoying the privilege of EU nationality, white ethnicity and comfortable social status and suddenly it's, it's quite sad that a thing like this had to shake my understanding of that but it did and, and um, I decided that I want to change that. I decided that even however small and however impactful it can be, um, maybe not at all, but it will be perhaps almost like it was with identity that I needed to somehow express what I was feeling and photography again became the tool to do so. But when I started I had no idea how it's going to end up. But I, I just could follow what I knew and what I knew was that I was just taking images. And, um, and, and there were certain things that I really, 
I felt, and there was there, and I was to start with. I thought I'm just gonna go and look for these symbols and and photograph them. For me, the biggest symbol of all, or like the word that was resonating with me, was rapture. For what happened was like rap, rap, rapture. Um, and so I was thinking of things that could could uh, translate translate that. But I was coming to the RCA with these images. And they were, I think, and like the response that I was getting for a long time was like, how are these images about, about Brexit? And, um, and, and I could see their, their, their rationale that um, they, they, was, they were too soft or too subtle or they were too, um, too beautiful. That was another thing that was a big problem that how they were, I was often asked, how can these beautiful pictures be about something so ugly, how can these pictures be about, how can these pictures be political? Um, and, and I was, for a long time, I was without words. I wasn't, I didn't have the, I didn't have the knowledge, I didn't have the voice, I didn't have the words yet to describe the work. And also it's very different because up until that point, I still, at that point, I still wasn't describing my practice as a flow. I wasn't telling you all about how I started this talk to, I wasn't, realizing all those interconnections that actually June made me realize that I recognize through creating this body of work that everything counts and that you don't have to differentiate between your personal and your commissioned and you don't have to differentiate between what you believe as a person, what you believe as an artist and that political and personal can't be bound together. But at the time I did not know that and I was really, really struggling. But um, and a lot of people were saying, why don't you do something else? Why don't you just move on? And uh, the idea of that was actually giving me physical discomfort. I thought, I trusted again, even though it's completely like the first year, I completely lost my confidence. I thought I'm, I'm useless and that this doesn't make any sense. But there was something that was not allowing me to stop. And, um, and then there was this, and again, coming to, to what I was talking about, the Taylor Wessing, about applying to things, there is a um, very prestigious um, competition uh, called Bloomberg New Contemporaries, which is for the um, for art students and recent graduates from, from art colleges, or people, all sorts of, like, if, if you look them up, the alumni is quite impressive. And it happens every year. And I didn't really know about it so much because it's much more of an art prize than photography prize. But uh, it was happening at the, in the, and I found out about it. It was the last day I could apply. And, um, and so I just sent these images through. And I was selected for it. And um, in uh, last year, in 2017, yeah, the, show, the work was shown in the Baltic in Newcastle and then also here in London in the... In the in the um, block 336. But the point being that at an opening evening, when the curator was talking about, it was shown in two different uh, locations and one, and also the theme was different from the locations. And they said about the one that my work was shown in, that the work that was in there was reflecting the current moment of rapture, current moment of um, insecurity and uncertainty about the political future. And um, for me, even that was such a little thing, but for someone to recognize it from these images was, gave, me, gave me courage to keep going. And, um, and, and so I did. Another thing is which for me was very important in, the, in shaping of the work was writing my thesis, writing my dissertation. Perhaps you have to do that as well here, I don't know. Um, but again, how that is so interlinked in how you think about your work and how you present your work. Um, I was writing about, I decided to write about empathy. Again, because um, at the time when I was choosing my theme, I was obviously, every day, first thing I did was checking the news. I was glued to, to the news feed. I was glued to what is actually happening. And the huge frustration that I had was that uh, in the immediate aftermath, and actually not in Im immediate, it was going on forever, um, there was, from the politicians, there was no recognition about how the vote has impacted on day-to-day -day life of people. It was talking, mostly in the media, it was about trade deals and about how the 
the currency is going to fall and when it's going to go back. And I felt very frustrated because I felt that actually the main um, loss that happened isn't the loss of free market or the customs union. The biggest um, loss is of is of the of is on the mental scale. It's of of freedom and it's of um, of the it's like it's a, it's a battle of broken community. It's like something that because for me, Europe is not just an idea. It's a heritage. I was born here and I know that um, it's that it shouldn't be taken for granted because only only um, it's only seventy years ago that that. Second World War finished and uh, ended, and and the fact and the, and what what the European Union, however flawed and however problematic it is, for me it's a heritage that we've been given from our grandfather, from our grandparents, and like historically, and it's about listening to what is Europe's story and to then go back on back on it and say, oh, actually no. Um, I don't really kind of like that, so bye. Uh, that was for me, that was for me heartbroken because, and also the speech that there was was no acknowledgement of what it means uh, for human interaction. So I decided to write about it, and um, and because for me empathy is very important, and empathy is very much part of my practice. But I also think that if People were more empathetic if empathy and and human um, um, and care for each other was more present in 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 the media and in the politics. We would be in a better place, even though it's not something that is really looked up at, like strength and uh, whatever. That's that's more important. But how says that empathy can't be a strength for us? Anyways, that's a different thing. But um, talking about photography. Like I say, I think there are two very similar themes, uh, very, very, even though there are, it's two lines, like my practice and my writing, they, again, they, they, the, the boundaries are blurred. And instead of me choosing other artists' work to go alongside my writing, I decided for my own imagery to go alongside the writing. And, but again, it was important that the writing is not going to describe what is in the images and that the image is not going to illustrate what is writing, but that once you read and once you see, there is going to be this understanding be between the two. Um, another important thing is, uh, was the titles. When, at the time when I finished, the ri finished my dissertation, which was at the end of um, year 2017, uh, I still didn't figure out this struggle I had with uh, contextualizing my work and how um, how this work is about Brexit, if you like. And one of the reasons what was a problem as well was that, I don't know if you can see it, but these images have still very descriptive titles, like this is not my face, this is somewhere over the La Manche, this is uh, where is home. This is no man is an island. Very descriptive, and actually now when I say that I even cringe because it doesn't make me feel comfortable, because the imagery itself is quite poetic and and um, and uh, subtle, and then giving them these poetic titles was just instead of enhancing what you're looking at, it was kind of making it almost cheesy, and um, and so I was I still had to I. I I needed to figure something out, and later on you'll see what mm. happened. Um, and how I came up to figuring this, how I came up to this breakthrough was through going back again to the images that were quite old and going back to my, my contact sheet. I had this almost Jackson Pollock moment where I took a China graph and I went, I, went, I was going through my um, um, contact sheet and I started writing straight onto them and thinking about what is um, what is core, what is the most important things that were happening at the time. A lot of people were saying that, uh, and it is still um, the case that these votes that now we are really experiencing the gap between uh, generations. Even even all the people who are advocating this people's vote are saying. 
artists, but the demographics has changed. Or so, so that was one. That was a big thing. Or another thing was, and I think this is an important um, moment in again the developing of the work was the eighth of June two thousand seventeen when snap election happened, which was only a few days before. Um, it was only a few days after the terrorist attack and only a few days before the Grenfell Tower fire. So a very intense, um, heavy week of political, social, um, personal tragedies, decisions, um, choices that were... And I was in the middle of it as, as an individual living in this country without having and not having a say. And I thought on the morning of the of the elections, what can I do? And again, photography for me became a voice. I took my camera and I went out and I took photographs. And and uh, and here you have a contact sheet of very like very five images of from this contact sheet ended up in in the book. Um, and this, like, you don't have to take images for for months, and then it can hit you all at the same time if you are just receptive to how 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 you feel. And and so what is written here is snap election day, labor roses, and blue borrow, words which um, perhaps are just like things that I was thinking about, but later on alluded to me what was important, the date. Um, politics, or like the events and uh, and symbolism of colors, for example, and places. Blue borrow not only just because it was blue, what blue represents, as in the color of sadness or European Union or Tory party, but uh, and then borrow as a as a place of of um, of an event as a place of. Um, which place which bears witness to, to an event, perhaps. And so I started to recognize the, the strengths of images. And this is, this is um, actually now, but last year, January 2018, when I was still very lost about in my, with my project, and, but I was, the, the time was getting hotter and hotter, and I thought, this is, needs to be resolved soon, or or what's, or yeah, how otherwise. And so I was making these constellations and again think when I had this on the wall uh, of, 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 on my place in my studio, I thought maybe I should just call this election day and this should be my show. Um, that was kind of already clicking, but again I thought, uh, but it's, um, it's not, it's not, it's not there, but it's not it's not that but um, so so I kept on I kept on exploring he, here is going to be a little um, loop forward and that's just because I want to show you how different images can operate in it in so this is a contact sheet which I kind of consider a piece of work in itself that I would exhibit it like this as well alongside an image on itself but then when I had when I had the exhibition in June uh, in, in Brighton, this is for those of you that came, this was how it was installed. And because of the decisions that I did, almost subconsciously, of how it's going to be shown and hung, and then the window was open and the air blew on the, from behind, and the, the print itself started moving and, and waving, almost, I like to sometimes say, breathing. And, and it was almost as if. The, what it what is depicted in the image became became the image. The blue tarpaulin in the work was doing the same thing. The moment that that the print is doing, if you if you see or uh, like similar, so so that here again it's just kind of bring bringing it back to the material and to the choices of of um, of or to, 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 the, to the different lives of the images that they can take on. Um, do I, are you still with me? Or <laughs> are you tired? This is a little moment of um, 
where I will talk about history again and actually what brought me to my origin and to my to my heritage again. For a long time, I was uh, I, I always described myself as a as a European artist rather than an Eastern European or Slovakian artist because a I haven't lived there for actually it's now marks half of my life that I lived outside of Slovakia, but. Um, for me, it wasn't important, and every time, ever since I started to travel, um, I felt a lot more at home abroad, and 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 um, and I kind of developed this almost like um, discomfort, and I don't want to say this not interest, but like I felt a lot more comfortable outside of Slovakia and in the Western world, as they say. But working on this project and then experience events of. Um, uh, 16th of, 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 of spring 2018 in Slovakia made me realize something about nationhood rather than nationality and about how um, in this in this climate where borders and and are where we and our belonging where we come from who sh who are we there it's discussed on everyday basis so so and how how do we stand how do we how, how do we how do we feel about it so I was born somewhere I have a certain passport I live somewhere else um, how am I gonna make sense of it and also in the context of the work that I was producing perhaps up until then it was always thinking about just the referendum or what was going on in this country but then a huge event happened in my home country and that is that a murder of an investigative journalist Jan Kuciak and his fiance um, there was there was it, it happened in their in the back of in in the comfort of their home and for a few days nobody knew about it but when the murder came to light when they found out it was it was horrible and it was really cold uh, they were he was shot in the head she was shot in the heart um, or the vice versa and what came to the light was that the last unfinished article of the writer was about Italian mafia connected to the Slovak, Slovak government, to the highest officials, so that is Home Secretary and the Prime Minister. Um, then you think like, okay, this is not unusual that journalists are being murdered, unfortunately, but it, how can it happen in a country which is part of the European Union? which calls it the self-democratic, progressive, liberal country, and suddenly the most fundamental human right, freedom of speech, is being threatened, especially as a, for journalists who are supposed to be the, the bearer of, of truth. Um, and this sparked a huge outcry in the country. And as you see, so this is the year 1989, and uh, it's a velvet, it's a velvet revolution day, 17th of November, 2000, uh, 17th of November, and this is March of this year. It's uh, this is when communist regime broke down. This is, and my parents stood on that square. This is 30 years later, and we are almost in the same place. And this, and I stood on that square. I find it incredibly moving to see that again talking about history repeating itself and that fighting our own battles and that we have to do that and that people say demonstrate like demo protests are redundant protests are old-fashioned I completely fundamentally disagree because the moment people come together perhaps it's not going to make the it's they're not going to make the law, change the law but I mean actually who knows what happened in Slovakia that after, after week after week people are gathering in the streets, then uh, Home Secretary resigned, then Prime Minister resigned, uh, it, got into pub in, it got into different medias, but also another really wonderful moving moment of togetherness was that uh, all the uh, Slovak newspapers joined, as well as some foreign uh, newspapers joined and they published the unfinished article at the same time which is uh, if perhaps the, the, the importance of that is that newspapers always fight like who's going to send who's going to publish a groundbreaking article first when media come together like this and they send that message that we stand behind this together that we stand behind uh, togetherness and behind freedom of speech um, it's it's a very subtle but very powerful message. 
to the people making decisions and to the people bluntly said bluntly ordering that murder. murder. Um, this is again an image from 30 years ago, which is um, where people were ringing the keys as a symbol of opening up the borders because in the Soviet Union, if back in the day, in the people like my parents never learned English because a it wasn't allowed because it was Western language equals devil, but also they never see the sort of point because how are they ever gonna get to anywhere that they need to speak English? So um, yeah, it was basically calling for the walls to come down. Now we are calling, and now we are finding ways to fund walls to be built, um, and then. This is the image from the same from from the protest in, in March, where people were coming back to this to doing that very same gesture, uh, and and it became one of the most important works for me in the body in, in, in June. But not only that, but it also made me realize that it's not only about Brexit. It's what is at stake is actually um, the. Like yeah, I think I th I believe our heritage as as and appreciating what happened in history and and taking into account or uh, the no the, the, what that what we have or we have had or is not to be taken for granted. Um, and suddenly there were these really important dates that I have realized I've gathered. So be it the election date or the anti-Brexit march or, or I happened to be in Holland on the day of their elections, which was the first election after Brexit where everyone was thinking about is it actually going to, what is going to be the impact on the rest of Europe? Is it going to go the populist nationalist route or is it has Brexit actually strengthened the rest of Europe in, in thinking of like, actually, we don't want this result. We want to protect the... We pro want to protect the idea that that represents to us. So I started to realize that that's so much more poignant that actually, if I name all the titles, all the photographs by their name, which this, this is Square of Slovak National Uprising, Bratislava, Slovakia, 16th of March 2019, which is the, this, the image I took it, I am almost giving it like a GPS coordinates. I'm rooting it into reality and there I'm giving you the information about where it was taken and if you put it into Google, almost, like um, you will find what happened. And, and, and there again was a difficult choice because you think like, um, but is it going to be enough? Uh, should I call it what it was? Should I give some more information? And um, and I and I decided now that actually, why should you as a viewer not do some work as well? Why? I think that is also a problem of how we consume information, how we consume um, imagery, how we consume events. Is that we just a lot of people just take it, and it's not their fault. It's not not their fault. I think it goes the fundamental place that needs to change is education, how, how we are taught to learn, and how we are taught to consume. And so, so yeah, I decided that I'm still going to be quite subtle and that I will, for you to completely get what I'm showing you, you need to do, you need to do some, some work as well. And what's then happened, uh, you can't really see it, but these are different, these are, these are uh, dates, these, these are titles of the works that were in Brighton. And then I realized that actually what I'm creating is, is a timeline. It's a, it's a chronicle of, of important events mixed with, with my personal experiences. Because, but there again, why should that not be the... Why, why should there... Is that a problem or, or not? And, and I came to a conclusion that for me, no, because it's a personal account of this experience. And in the end of the day, history is personal. History is... Um, subjective often even in the textbooks that we have they are written from the point of view of the victory side or whatever or have been or like and actually still still are uh, in many places so 
the so the, yeah and then and then the, the way i structured the book was that it was super simple um i just thought what is important and that is just the imagery and the date and so this was this was the light actually this image this image that i was talking about sophie hume the handbag designer this was taken as a commission when she sent me to um when i went on a this was a day when she sent me to an antique market where she often goes to seek for inspiration. So, and it was a week before the referendum, it was pissing down with rain, and I felt really horrible because I knew what is coming. And that image, actually, for the first time, was shown on their Instagram as an as a image of inspiration. But to me, that's because even though it was taken as a commission, that was also taken with, a sense of, with my own sensitivity and with my own the reasons of that I can't really put my word down, but it didn't make a difference to me. It was it had, it had place in that body of work. Um, yeah, there are just few examples. This this was from the first anti-Brexit march. Um, this is uh, on the Bastille Day in Nice, where what where, when um, the terrorist attack of the truck running into the people on the promenade happened and I and actually ended ended up there and um, we ended up having about seven people in our hotel hotel room seeking shelter. Um, again, why it ended up in the, in, in the work? Because it was a personal experience of mine, but at the same time, the things that the, the, the events like this and how they are handled by uh, by right-wing media and right-wing right -wing politicians and the fear-mongering that comes along with it is one of the reasons why we have um, why we are in the why we have an environment as 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 poisonous as we have or as scary as we have and and um, and it, it actually belongs to belongs to that work um, this is the image from, from Holland on the day of their election. And this is the image of, uh, that symbolizes the Grenfell Tower fire, which again had my, it had, I believe it has a really important part of the history of this country and on, on how things are handled and shows. And it's, it, but ex as well, it, it goes through my own exper personal experience of going there and volunteering because like I said, I was writing about empathy and I was so frustrated about what was um, going on in, the, in, in relation to the politics and the public and how those two are so disconnected. It's, 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 um, it's, it's kind of jarring. Um, and, and, so, and then when, when, when the fire happened, the, the immediate response wasn't coming from the council, wasn't coming from the government, wasn't coming from the opposition. It came from the grassroots of the community. They were, I'm sure you've seen the news and you probably, you, some of you might even went there. I lived, I lived at the time I lived in Hammersmith, which is very, just a few stops away. And I was writing about empathy in time of political crisis. So I, I just, I thought how hypocritical it would be of me if I just stay. I, I kind of it was, it was wrong for me to stay at home. I needed. I, I I wanted to be there, even though I already heard that. Oh well, it's it's actually an outcry. It's it was overflowing with people wanting to help, with people bringing things in. But, um, but it was even though, coming there, you could just you just. It it was one of the most moving experiences I've had and um, also one of the most conflicting experiences I've had because I did take my camera there and um, and I was really thinking um, when I after the day when I was leaving home I wanted to take a photograph because of what it represented to me and what it represented for the work as well and um, and also just again like bearing witness to what I've just experienced <laughs> but I was so nervous um, and and I had this big moral question mark about about my head can I do that and some of you who've used you have Namiya 7 but it's a rangefinder and it has two buttons one of one opens 
the curtain between the lens and the film, which actually enables you to take an image, and the other opens um, the back of the camera. And if you open the back of the camera, you expose the film to light, and, and when you do that, you burn the film. When I did that, and I, and I did exactly that because of just not being focused, panicking, and then I, so I, 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 op I did it, I said, oh shit, fuck, and closed it, um, and did take some other pictures, but um, disregarded this completely. I just thought, oh, it's a mistake. And only later, when I was actually creating the, the work, I realized, I was looking at the contact sheets, and I was looking at the works I had, and I thought, actually, this is, this is, this is what it, the, what, it's a burnt material which reminds, which has a shape of the, which, ha which has a shape of the tower, and which has the shades of a flame, how much more poignant and how much more respectful it actually is to show something like that. What is a mistake than showing the, the charred monument of, of, of the tower? And this is to say that sometimes showing, sometimes again you don't have to be literal in, sh in showing, sh showing um, something so visceral and figurative. And yeah, there are a few images from the, from the exhibition. This is the book, which was um, divided into 24 little booklets, and every booklet represented a month. So in the end, it became, visually, it became a, a, a diary, a chronicle, and also, again, everything started to, everything was, all the choices, even materially, were, um, were symbolic. And... Um, so the thicknesses of certain months, this is in June 2017, it was the thickest month in the whole body of work. And then sometimes there was nothing. Sometimes even the blankness of a page became powerful and, and, it, showed, and it, it showed the flow of images. The loop, again, like I said, it was just a simple way of, of symbolizing the, his, the repeated history and, and it could open and then you could separate all the different months and that for me was the idea of that doesn't mean that any of those it's still every single booklet holds their importance and holds their um, uniqueness and significance but only as a group they make sense only as a group they they send the message that they they should send a little um, remark to the strength of the union um, The work then got um, um, featured in the FT Weekend magazine, which again was a beautiful accomplishment because somewhere where I, <coughs> where I was commissioned to make work for them, now they were featuring my own work, which has been really, um, it's, it's been an honor. And then also, um, as we all know, we still have no idea what is happening, and so the story continues, and I keep shooting. And what June actually did for my own practice is that it created a framework for me which helps me to, um, to realize that how, how, I, how I work and how I operate, that, that these events are historically important historically but they're also important pers personally to all of us and it's our choice of because so for example this is from the people's people's march on 20th of um, uh, october 2018 it's at uh, hyde park corner at the queen elizabeth gate and and it's very symbolic it's only when you look further when you look deeper you start seeing the flags and the poles but again like something up so so symbolic about hand and then and the Queen Elizabeth Gate and the, the, like everything, but I would still be there if I didn't make the work because I believe in that. And so the political and the personal again inter intersects in in something. This is the image from of the Westminster on the on the 11th of December, the date when they were supposed to vote, but in the end Sir Theresa May cancelled the vote and and. And it's like this, you see, you see the facade, and I mean, I'm not going to talk about 
this this the the surface of the image that's that's there for you to see but being there and knowing what is happening behind these walls or what is not happening behind these walls and what those walls represent is 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 pulsating it's still there and it's still it's still work it still has um has a presence and then this is on the 12th of january when the, a month later when uh it's just a contact sheet um, but again i was there because i believed in it but because of this framework which, which i've created and and I, I have deep interest, and it's not, I have no idea what will happen with these images. If there will, if there will be continuation, or if there is actually a book published, um, if these will be, if these will become part of the same publication, or, or what. But um, I'm not giving myself the constraint. It's almost like with identity that after it happened, after I started, I started working with. I kept on working with other. Uh, I kept on making more portraits, but some of them I could feel that they were not. Um, that they didn't have the power that the previous ones had. With these images, I still feel that they have the power, but how are they going, going to live? I'm not quite sure yet, but um, we, that's the days of uncertainty we live in. So yeah, thank you very much. I think that's plenty. <laughs> thank you very much, that was brilliant. Um, has anybody got any questions, Ms. Lisa? Yeah. Uh, the turnover. Um, really quickly, actually. Um, so there are still film labs around, which uh, can give you turnarounds in two hours if you are adamant, um, like I am. And uh, and then I have bought. Um, a flat bat scanner, Epson 750, which is uh, perfectly good for editorial. Like I would not, I mean, I print, I hand print for exhibitions, anyways. But um, for editorial, it's completely fine because even their print quality isn't amazing. But for up to A3, the scans from the flat bat are fine, and they it costed me 350 pounds I bought it on the day when I won John Coble award and it has been brilliant this is scanned on that it's you for the for the magazine you don't have to send them as a low resolution you don't have to send them perfectly retouched images or perfectly colored you could send them this and they like they can see and then only after they make a selection you you do a high resolution scan so you can send the uh, last week I did a shoot for Belgian newspaper I handed it, like I shot in the morning when in the afternoon I did um, I went to the lab waited for the films to be uh, developed came home did the uh, the, uh, the contact sheets sent them the same evening they had them next morning so it's n like if you if you can make it work <laughs> yeah um, Good question. Depends on what old photos are. It's uh, um, with this with this work. There were a few images which I took. Um, no, actually, no. This work, not this one, was because it was a chronology. So, so that was. But like I say, if I I often imagine. Uh, Cross section of the work. So if I, because so I was actually um, nominated for a huge prize um, for Paul Oof Award, uh, which is give, which is with Foam um, Museum in Amsterdam, and you have to send you have to send two pro projects at minimum. And I'm like, okay, that's a problem, but how do I do that? Because it's one project. But then I think, actually, yeah, maybe the time <coughs> element of the work can be played on and can be used creatively even. It's, yeah, it's also like image, yeah, that image, um, it's titled United Kingdom Europe 23rd of June, but I didn't take it on that, in, on that day I, because I didn't know what was, so, so even though that's a very, mine, that's a, that's a very, that's like one, no, there are two, two exceptions to that uh, project where 
the date when the photograph was taken wasn't the actual date when the photograph was taken, but conceptually it was important. The other one was, um, I don't have it in the presentation, the other one was 27th of January 2017, which was when um, Trump's Muslim ban came into, um, to, into practice. Again, I didn't take a photo on that day, but that was the day when I realized that, that it, I was moved by that. And even though it was reaching out of Europe, again, it wasn't about, it wasn't about that one, that day is not about Brexit, but it's again made me realize the, the consequences those decisions have on, on the idea that the work is about, because even June, the reason why it's called June there, like the most, the easier one is that, okay, it, it's named after the month of the referendum, but also June comes from uh, Latin for juvenile, which is youth as well. Like these decisions are ma being made and it's the people who are going to be the most affected are youth. Is people are people, is, is, is the youth who is going to live with the consequences for majority of the life. So what I'm trying to say is that the time is not, again, just something that is rigid as I see it. It's something that can be that is porous and that can be used creatively. So, if I answered your question, <laughs> do, you, do you often uh, <clears throat> have like a, a set sort of goal to achieve in terms of how you present the work? Um, are you always looking to either make a book or an artifact or an exhibition or show? Or does that just purely come out of what you're doing? That purely comes out from. Uh, this very moment from the con, con from the um, what I'm given as well. So, what, what, it's an interesting question in relation to my degree and then Brighton because so yeah, I finished my degree in June. There was this beautiful synchronicity as well in the timing that my final degree show opened on 23rd of June 2018, exactly two years after the referendum. Um, but so so that was the day when I showed the work for the first time, but it was a degree show where I was restricted with the size, with the with the fact that it was shown in alongside other people whose work was very different. So, and and it was done in haste, and it was done in. Uh, actually, when I installed my show, I still didn't have the book. It was. So I thought when I was installing the sh final show, I saw that the, the prints are the final product, the final result of the of my degree. But because the book happened, so my birthday is on twenty third of June of of twenty third. <laughs> that would be funny. Um, twenty <laughs> third of April, and uh, my friend from Germany called me to wish me happy birthday, and he happens to be a graphic designer and. Um, he said, oh, I, re I changed my website not so long before, but he was like, oh, I really like your website. Um, it's nice and clean. Uh, if you ever want to do a book, maybe give me a ring. Perhaps we can do something together. At the time, I was trying to make sense of two years worth of work. And I thought, you know, actually, uh, it would be a good time. How about now? <laughs> and, uh, and this is, yeah, like end of April, where uh, I have to have installed everything. We, I was coming into the install day, and on the 1st of June, everything had to be done and finished, and that's it. And my, um, and my oh yeah, that's, that's, that was the important date for that, was that my exam was first week of June. And so, when, when, once we started talking, he was like, yeah, yeah let's have a look. Um, and once I started to have this conversation, how it started was that he said, send me a PDF of, of the work, and, and that would be the first step. <coughs> Even that first PDF, how I st how I started making sense of what, how can I show him this body of work was that I started by months. So the PDF was organized in like, oh, June 2016, July 2016, August, September, blah blah blah, up until April 2018, and um, and that's what I sent to him, and he was like, oh, this is really interesting. So uh, he his what he recognized was that. But first of all, he said, so how many images do you imagine the book to have? Um, the, the kind of common ground is between 40 and 60. 
I sent him 200. Um, and he said, okay, let's try to cut it down, but not too much. Just, uh, he, he said, look, go through the same PDF and mark the images which are important. And so, yes, that's what I did. I just used uh, color um, frames on the images that were important. And I sent him back to it. And we came down to, I think, about 150. And he said, I mean, I like it all. It gives, it gives a sense of time. It gives a sense of your experience. And actually, people say less is more. But in this particular case, I think more is more. And so I was like, OK. And the more we were talking, the more we were actually coming up with the realization that it has to be divided into months and that, and that it could be divided into months. He said, he said there are these rings. Um, there are these uh, rings that uh, when that, that you can put through, and that like we were thinking of, uh, you know, what you like the horrible th those horrible folders where you put uh, your taxes or <laughs> you, you know those. So we were thinking you know, something like that, um, and then he came up with the idea of these, and then we said, and actually yes, if we, and then I said because it it has these exactly two years. Uh, two years period, so we could make it into 24 booklets, so that would be completely the, the complete two years. And then he said, Oh, and then there are these rings which we could open, and you can play with time, you can mix time, you can, you can, you don't know, even though it starts with June, but you could, you could twist it and you could start with April, you could start with um, the last month of the, of, of, of the series, you could add to it, you can take away from it. So suddenly it became everything became important and uh, and that was yeah so <laughs> when I when I installed my degree show I was I was super proud like I had these these beautiful pristine prints mounted on aluminium but then I received the book and the book came on in the morning of my exam day so I was actually it was supposed to come the, arrive day before but uh, yeah, there was a problem, so it arrived in the morning, and then I took it. I just managed to compile it into the order, and I went straight into the exam room, and I was, <laughs> and suddenly, like, we were not even talking about prints. We were like, well, I just made this, <laughs> and it kind of makes sense. It made um, so what was I had no I had no idea until I actually held it. But when I held it, I rec recognized that this is the work, and that the prints are just like extensions of the work that they. They uh, they represent something else, and they could be taken individually, and then they stand for for themselves. Like, yeah, you can you can have an image like where is it? Yeah, like this. So you could put it on your wall, and you can just enjoy uh, the, the surface and what it is. But in the context of the whole work, it suddenly gets a different layer to it. And um, and and then I got the opportunity to show in Brighton, and because I recognized that um, at RCA, I what I really struggled with was that I'm talking about fragility and I'm talking about vulnerability, and even and I saw that having prints which are not in frames will be enough that that will be translating that idea of um, of openness and of of um, you know because also that's another reason for me conceptually why I like using with using film and analog material because it's fragile and it's very very um, it can be damaged so easily just like human relationships you can look up you have to look after them and you ha they are precious and and if if something happens to the negative um, that, that, that's it so either and I have to embrace the damage, or I have, uh, or or there is no way, no way back in a way, and but what was happening at RCA with the prints being mounted on this hard material? It was, it was cold. It was like, um, it was, yeah. You couldn't feel the work, and then so I got the opportunity to show the work on a much larger scale in a, with in a solo show in Brighton, and I was like, okay, I'm going to risk. Um, 
I have no idea how this is going to work out, but I want the images to be floating. I want the images to have the same quality that they have when I print them in the dark room because I print on a, on a roll. So I print from on a paper that is on a roll, not cuts into sheets. So when they come, they already they, they are they are curling, and there is something so. Yeah, you can't really put down. I can't really put it down in words. What it is that 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 there is this. But yeah, I think that the closest I can get is that they breathe because they respond to you moving. They respond to temperature. When at, at the opening of the show, when there were so many people and the air became really humid, a lot of them were going crazy because yeah, the the the, the paper is organic material, so it responded to the humidity of the of the room. And people would be probably, some of the people would go crazy saying, "Oh my God, this is distorting and destroying my work." But I kind of took it as um, as a, as part of it that the work, my work, conceptually is responsive to the environment I live in, and the works are responsive <coughs> to the environment that they are shown in. So, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was just wondering, just uh, uh, we'll, we'll stop in a minute and we'll go to, uh, go to London. Um, I was just wondering if you had any sort of advice for the students in terms of. Because um, one of the reasons that I got in touch with you to come and talk is because I thought it was just really inspiring in the way that you kind of sense and trust in what you're doing. And, you know, things are often unresolved and it, and it will resolve itself later on or you know there isn't a clear-cut path whereas I often think one of the struggles that the students have and you know and I understand it because we all have the same struggles too is that we're often looking for answers and we want them to resolve straight away whenever we're making them. Yeah. So I, was just wondering, I don't know if you've got any tips or if it's if it's just as simple as trust in yourself or any advice in, in, you know because some of the, I mean we've got all years in here um, got some people that are finishing in a few months time some people that will be you know here for another two years or so mm. yeah. well the advice I can give is just again like the experience I went through and um, it just kept keeps repeating over and over and over again that um, just like trusting if if you feel comfortable with what you're what you are doing and sometimes doesn't and sometimes just doesn't make any sense be it either the decision to apply to a fine art course on a university you have no idea about basically it was just easy for me to get to because I was going to go high school it just so happened that this is where I applied and there and I was not even looking at photography department I was looking at fine art departments so crazy just but I, I just did it then um, transferring to photography degree because that's what seems to I have. That's what I was needing at the moment because I've heard there is structure. I needed structure, doing that, um, taking, putting myself completely fully into into it because um, what's the point otherwise? I mean, that's what I'm gonna tell you. If you are not ready to give it everything, then it's very hard. It's uh, it's. So, so you can like you could say perhaps that, um, that I have a talent for taking photographs. Uh, you could say I have um, had some. I, I I was lucky. I was in the right place at the at the, at the right time. But as well, you once I sh once I hint towards the journey that I went through, it was actually very very. Um, sometimes I'm surprised myself where where I ended up. But because of all these decisions that I took <coughs> along the way, but um, one one thing that was always important was that I was listening to how I felt, and um, sometimes it's really difficult because also in your personal decisions, I'm sure you go through that yourself, um, that your brain is telling you one thing, but you f your heart is telling you the other thing, and. Me going to do the MA at the RCA was um, perhaps my mind telling me, I'll do it now because then Brexit will happen and you'll have to get out of the country or you'll have to pay um, twice as much or, or, or j j just do it. But 
the, my reason of doing it, applying then, I didn't really, I didn't really understand all the all the dates that will come to play. I didn't didn't look up when I was applying to BRCA. I didn't look up when the the referendum will be and when my o degree show will be opening. It was kind of written for me. I don't know how to, how to how otherwise to take it. I kind of I don't want to sound like I'm spiritual. Like I'm I don't want to make it spiritual, but I do believe that there is. Um, there are certain energies that pull us to make certain decisions and throughout the process at the RCA like I was so I completely lost the confidence in the first year when I remember one of the most critical crits um, it was in the time of um, it was it's what is really beautiful is that I can now go back to the work and I can actually refer to uh, to a certain section in June because like oh that was the time when I was taking portraits because I was thinking maybe I need to take more portraits because I need to show the people who have been who have been impacted by this decision so there were people who lost jobs because the job um, the, because the employer was scared that oh they are European so we don't know how it's gonna influence how it's going to have impact on us giving them work permit. So he lost the job. There was a person who uh, was really struggling to um, find a job as well because she was, she's a kind of, actually Delphina, the girl that, that um, I showed you the examples of, she, she was, she's like super smart, but she wasn't able to get a job here and she was deciding to move to Brit to Germany, but she didn't really want to move to Germany. Another person's relationship fell apart, and uh, oh, sorry. Um, what's going on? I'm sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> another reason, yeah. Um, so, at the time when I was doing this, I was taking photos of a uh, lot of young people, and uh, at the crit there was this girl. She was a painting because RCA there you, we have cross. Uh, Cross school crits, so it wasn't just that I had crits with photographers, I had crits with people from different departments. And she looked at the wall, I didn't even have to, I didn't even start saying anything, and she was like, How is this about Brexit? This is just like from a fashion magazine portfolio, or these are just beautiful people, blah, blah, blah. And again, beauty was one problem that was like, and those people, it's not like, it's. They, everyone, everything is beautiful if you see, if you want to see it that way, if you manage to capture it that way. And why can't, why cannot beauty be associated with, uh, with something painful? It's almost like all of the imagery that is connected to this, to, to, to the current times or like to the bad. It's Nigel Farage in front of uh, migrants. Like, you know, is that the only thing that we want? That, the situation to be represented with why ca why can't the beauty actually work as as, as something that you sh should draw you in and and it's it, why should not be like because yeah imagery can be viewed as just a mirror that you can look at it and that's in, that's it that's that's enough but I often like to see it in a way that it's more of a window shop front window that it's when you look at it from further away you see a reflection and, and so that way there is that mirror quality, but if you come closer, you start seeing what is behind it. And, um, and but that crit was really painful in terms of like, okay, am I full of shit? Do I, am I just pretentious? Am I, am I, what, what am I doing? But I stuck, stuck with it after having lots of conversation with my <laughs> tutor, um, who just said, you should trust yourself. And you, if you feel like it, you can you can ab abandon the project because it's problematic because it is giving you lots of stress. But I'm telling you, I think you are making significant images, and it would be a shame. So sometimes, yeah, of course, you need someone to help you, and that's one of the reasons. Like I encourage you so strongly to share work with each other and don't be scared of it because um, universities are great, but when you come out of it, um, you'll be alone. Like when I showed you the black frame that was how it was and that was after BA and that was um, everyone like it's also not normal that you spread apart and you are you have to look after yourself and and everyone is trying to make a living and and but 
if you make the connections between each other, if you can find someone who can who understands your language personally and visually and intellectually, they're going to be the ones you know that you can rely on them later because tutors as much as they will be there for you, most of the times they have other students that will be coming and they are overworked and underpaid and, and that's a whole different story of this country and not only this country, but um, like the strength is here and and that's been my experience, so just yeah, stick, stick with it. Very broad answer to your question, which I'm sorry it's about. Good. It's good. It's good. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.